Well, I was working up in my office yesterday getting my staff planner ready um, to present this week to pastor. And uh, I don't know, it was uh, sometime in the morning, and I got a uh, phone call from pastor. And pastor said that he was not doing well and asked if I would be willing to preach this morning. And I said, pastor, that'd be a great honor. And I'm thrilled always to have the opportunity to preach to, to my church. And um, so I said, absolutely, pastor. As soon as we hung up, I said to myself, oh, boy. So, Lord, what, you know, I know it's going to be around Christmas, so what do I preach? Five minutes later, I got a text from pastor. He sent me his outline. And, uh, and uh, I said, thank you, Lord. I got my message, I guess. And uh, he's starting a, a, a series today, Jesus is Our King. And um, so he sent me his outline. I said, you know what? I got, I got into that. And I got pretty excited about that. So I'm thrilled uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to preach to you pastor's message today that I believe is from the Lord. And God's already worked it in my life as well. I, I was thinking that our theme is, uh, our, our title of our series is Jesus is our King. And um, my mother-in-law uh, sent, or I got something from my mother-in-law this past week. It is a mask. And the mask, my mother-in-law and uh, my father-in-law uh, lived in Israel on three different kibbutzim for over 40 years. So they have a lot of great connections in Israel, a lot of good friends and, and everything. And uh, this mask is from Israel. And it is said that not only Will it protect you from the virus? It's supposed to even fight the virus. I don't know if there's like a zinc lighting in it or whatever. So my mother-in-law, because you got to always be careful to get something like that from your mother-in-law, okay? No, but honestly, I love my mother-in-law, and I know she loves me, and she wanted me to be protected. So I got a mask from Israel to protect me. Now, I'm not positive how well the mask from Israel will work, but I will tell you this. I also received a Messiah from Israel, and that's worked real well. And I don't know how well this will protect me, but the Messiah from Israel has protected me from the penalty of sin. And I'm so thankful uh, that you're here today uh, to hear this message. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And I do count it a great honor and a privilege, and I do thank my pastor for this opportunity to speak today. The title of the message is The Introduction of Our King, and we're going to look a little bit about how he was introduced, the message of the king, the miracle, the miracle of the king, and um, we're going to look at the mission of the king as well. But first of all, we want to see the message of the king. Luke chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 26. And I'm going to ask, what a great passage here, uh, that Luke, under the inspiration of the, word, uh, of the Spirit of God, uh, gave us this incredible historical record. And uh, we're going to read verses 26 through 38. So let's stand this morning for the reading of God's word. And let's look at this. We'll have a quick word of prayer, and we'll get started. We'll also take a moment at that time and pray for pastor as well. Verse 26, and in the sixth month, now when was that sixth month? Okay, so that sixth month is referring to uh, Elizabeth has now been pregnant for six months with John the Baptist, and he's going to be born in about three more months after this. Uh, but in the sixth month of Elizabeth, who is the cousin of Mary, uh, in her sixth month of pregnancy is what is referred to here, Gabriel's going to come back. He was with um, Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband, in the temple. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But now he comes back again to visit somebody else. And in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God Onto a city of Galilee, Gal, Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, a spouse betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail! 
Thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. By the way, it didn't say above women, it said among women. And when she, wa- and when she saw him, she was troubled in his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name, everyone together, Jesus. Yeah, Yeshua. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be seen I know not a man? She did not doubt that it would happen. She just wondered, how is it going to be happened? Different than Zacharias. We'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. And then I just think we all need to quote this verse together. This could be your memory verse for the week, all right? Everyone together, verse 37, real loud behind those masks. Everyone together. For with God. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And notice Mary's response. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. By the way, look at the first three words of verse 39. And Mary arose. The word there means to start a journey. And wow, what a journey that's going to be. Father, I pray today that Luke chapter 1 will come alive into our life, that there will be application. I pray, Lord, that which you worked in pastor's heart and worked in my heart, I pray will be worked now in the members here at Lancaster Baptist and those watching and the guests with us today. Father, if there is someone here today that may recognize Christ as a historical figure, but never has been revealed to them that he is their savior, may today be the day of salvation, for that is why Christ came. I pray, Father, for all of us that do know, that do believe in Jesus Christ as our personal savior from sin, may we consent the way Mary did. May we be willing to do your will according to your word, the way and the heart that Mary had as well. So speak to our heart as we prepare for Christmas. And then, Lord, we take a moment and we pray for the chapels. I pray for Pastor. I ask, Lord, that he will recover. He will recover completely and swiftly. I ask, Lord, that the pandemic in America would go away. In the name of Jesus Christ, would you begin to to spare us from this? I pray for our pastor. I pray that during this time, you would reveal what you would want to show him about who you are. And Father, I thank you for our pastor. And I do pray for Mrs. Chapel. I'm sure there's some apprehension in her heart right now. God, comfort her, be with her. And we are thankful for Pastor and Mrs. Chapel. Be with them now, Lord. And as we study together the word, speak to our heart. Give us the application that you want us to have. We pray all these things in the name of our soon-to-come King. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And God's people said, you may be seated. Thank you. Let's look at the message of the king that's coming here. The message, we find that in verses 26 through 28. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent 
from God. I want you to see, first of all, that this message of this coming king is given by a heavenly messenger. That heavenly messenger, two things about him you need to know. Number one, he is a special angel. He's really special. Matter of fact, you know, there's only three angels that we know of that, that we know other names to. One is Michael the archangel. Other is Lucifer, who is now known as Satan. And the third is Gabriel. Now, Gabriel's mentioned four times in the scriptures, twice in Daniel and twice in the book of Luke. And by the way, this is kind of interesting. If you ever wanted to give a, a really cool trivia question, how about this one? What is the common denominator between Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Babylon? What is the common denominator in the Bible of Jerusalem, Babylon, and Nazareth? You know what it is? In those three places, Gabriel visited someone. Remember now, there's a 400-year period from when Gabriel visited, or really 500 years since he visited Daniel, um, and all this time of silence since the book of Malachi, now Gabriel is sent from God with a message to Zacharias in the temple about six months earlier than what we're reading right here when Gabriel comes back. So Gabriel is a very special angel. Um, and however, the second thing is I want you to see about Gabriel is where he came from and who sent him. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was apostello. That's the Greek word. It means to be sent. We get the word apostle from that. And he is sent from God with a message. Now I want to tell you something. He's not sending angels anymore. Now it's our job. Now we're the ones that are sent. It's our job to get the gospel out. In fact, if you ever realize how many angels would say, hey, hey, Lord, Lord, can, if they're not, if they're not going to hand those things out about peace on earth, can we go tell them? Can we do it like we did with the shepherds? Can, can we go and evangelize? Because I got to tell you, there's a lot of people in that country of America that aren't doing anything. And yet all of us are sent. We all have the message. It is our responsibility now. We are the sent ones. We are the ones that God has sent to give the message. And, you know, I find it interesting. In the book of Acts, an angel comes to the Roman soldier, uh, the centurion soldier, Cornelius. And the, it's very interesting. The angel says to, to the centurion, Cornelius, you need to get Peter to come to give you the gospel on how to be saved. Now, isn't that interesting? And the, the fact of the matter is the angel's like, can, can, can I do it, Lord? No. Now it is the apostle job, it is our job, the sent ones, to now give the gospel. And folks, Gabriel was sent with a message from God to uh, Mary. I wonder today, this week, I want you to consider something. I believe all of us are sent to people during this pandemic. Uh, how we communicate the message and how we get it to them and how far apart we are from them, it doesn't negate that we are the sent ones. As Gabriel was a sent angel and a special angel, we too now have that commission as well. The second thing I want you to see, it was given by a heavenly messenger, but it was also given in a humble place. Notice this place. He was sent from God Onto a city called Rome. No. Onto a city called Babel. No. Onto a city called Jerusalem. No. Onto a city of Galilee named everyone together Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is a city that's on a major thoroughfare from Tyre and Sidon to Jerusalem. And it's about the halfway point. It's about 70 miles northeast of Jerusalem. A saying used to be, if you want wisdom, go to Jerusalem. If you want wealth, go to Nazareth. Nazareth is not liked by the Jews, though there's several Jews living there. 
And the reason being is because it was on this thoroughfare, there was a lot of merchants and different ones that would come from Tyre and Sidon on their way to Jerusalem or Jerusalem back to Tyre and Sidon. And about halfway on that journey was this city called Nazareth. So therefore, it was permeated. Yes, there were Jews there, but it was permeated with Gentiles and Romans. And many of the Jews felt those Jews that were in Nazareth were contaminated by those Gentiles and those Romans. Next thing about Nazareth, it's kind of like a city that would be on this thoroughfare. And the best thought I had on this was like a truck stop. This is kind of the truck stop between Tyre and Sidon and Jerusalem that you would stop and get nourishment or refreshment or what what it may be, you know, water your camels or, or whatever it would be, but it would be almost kind of like a truck stop. Let me tell you something. It wasn't a very nice place at all. An extremely ordinary place. So when pastor sent me his notes yesterday, He had something really cool written here. You know what he had written next to it? Just one word. He didn't didn't explain the, the, the illustration or anything. He just had one word and I loved it. You know what he had next to Nazareth? Lancaster. And you know what? I think a good comparison between a modern day Nazareth would be Lancaster, California. You know, Lancaster is not the most popular city in California at all. But you know what? In a very ordinary place, God has done an extraordinary work. And I just want to share this with you, Lancaster Baptist Church. We kind of live in Nazareth, but that doesn't mean God can't use us. The greatest message that's ever been given came to a very ordinary city called Nazareth. And we too have been blessed so much by what God has given to us. And I will tell you, you want to know a modern day Nazareth? I think in many ways, I would call it Lancaster, California, Palmdale area, Antelope Valley, you know, and I guess it's about halfway between here and Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Who knows, you know? But I think there's a, there's a definite, it's a definitely humble place. But that's what God uses. God uses the Nazareth in this world to do the extraordinary. It's given by a heavenly messenger. It's given by a humble, in a humble place. And it's given to a holy woman. And I want you to see that in verse number 27. To a virgin. This holy woman, she was pure. She was poor. And because of that, she was preferred. I want you to see her purity even in the word virgin. Now, it may be possible... That some of you are thinking, oh, this is when this guy goes into this virgin birth thing, this virgin conception thing, which we know is biologically impossible and absolutely never happened and it's supernatural and I don't believe in that at all. And I want to share this with you. If you're here today and you do not believe in a virgin conception, you do not believe in a virgin birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, God has given you a free will to be able to believe whatever you want to believe. And if you deny that, that is between you and your God. But do know this. There is no question the Bible teaches a virgin birth. Now, it may be that you deny it. It may be that you go like, that is biologically impossible, and that it is. This is going to be a supernatural, glorious conception and birth of a child without a human father. That is absolutely correct. You may deny that and not want to believe that, but you cannot deny the fact the Bible teaches it. It even teaches it in the Old Testament. Now, some of you might say, oh yeah, well, the Old Testament thing where it says that he will give you a sign a virgin shall conceive. Surely you know, Jim, that the Hebrew word for virgin there has the idea of a young woman. Yeah, yeah. But then it says it shall be a sign. 
I don't know about you, but when I hear that a young woman's having a baby, I'm going like, well, that's who has babies, is young women. That's who, that's not a sign. It doesn't get my attention. That's who has babies. But a young lady that never had physical intimacy with a man, yeah, that's a sign. And that that one will be a child and it will be Emmanuel, God with us. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to see how important that virgin birth is. But I think here it plays to the fact that this one, Mary, was pure. She was right with her God. She was real. And she was ready to be used by her Lord. She was holy woman. She was pure. But number two, she was poor. You say, yeah, I suppose if you lived in Nazareth or whatever, you probably were pretty poor. And the evidence of their poverty, her and Joseph, was when they do dedicate Jesus to the temple 40 days after he's born, that they come with the, the gift of somebody that was living in poverty in what they offer to the Lord because of their poverty. So you say she was poor. Well, that, well, how does that make her holy? Well, that's the wrong use of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of Matthew 5, 3. How about you? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. I think Mary was poor in spirit in that she was helpless and that she was needy. And I think we have the formula on how to be preferred. The formula how to be uh, favored, extraordinary. Notice, or highly favored. Look at verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. You know what that words mean? Endued by God's grace. And this is the grace, this is the idea of the ability to do something. That God has given Mary an endowment of his grace. How did Mary, why was Mary highly favored? Because I think she was a pure woman and I think she was poor in spirit. And that combination will always make you preferred to receive the grace of God. You say, Brother Shella, that sounds good. Where'd you get all that? Take your Bibles, hold it in Luke 1, we'll be back. Take your Bibles and turn quickly to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and let me read you this. James 4, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 6. The Bible says, but he giveth more grace. Hey, there it is, highly favored. That's what you want. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Those that are needy, those that are helpless, those that are poor in spirit, he giveth grace. Look at verse seven. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Now look at this, purity. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Look at verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And I think that's exactly what Mary did. And he, that would be God, shall lift you up. I think the formula for being preferred is she was pure and she was poor. And I believe purity plus humility will always equal God's grace. And I think she was a holy woman. We see a humble place. We see a heavenly messenger of the message of the king. But secondly, I want you to see is the mission of the king. The mission of the king. Look at this. Starting in verse number 31. And behold, thou shall conceive and in thy womb and bring forth a son. This is an appointed person and this appointed person is a son referring to the humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you, Jesus is just as much God as if he was never man, but he's also just as much man as if he was never God. Jesus is humanity. He came as a person. Now there's something that he's missing we're going to talk about. He doesn't have that Adamic nature that all of us were born with. 
And that's why he had to be born of a virgin. But he, is, he thirsted, he hungered, he tired. If he hit his finger with his hammer in the carpenter shop working with his dad, his finger would have swollen as well. He hungered, he got, he, thir- he tired, he slept in the, in, the, in the ship on the Sea of Galilee. We see that he was as much man as us. We see he was an appointed son. But number two, he had an appointed name. And that name is going to give us the mission of this king. Everyone, help me out here. And behold, thou shalt conceive and in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name, everyone together, Jesus, Yeshua. Now, Jesus is the Greek translation of this word, Yeshua, which we also get Joshua, and it means Jehovah is salvation, or Jehovah saves. So in other words, Mary, the one that you will conceive will be Jehovah in the flesh. It is going to be, he is going to be God. And God is going to come to this earth and he is going to save his people. Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah in the flesh. Bible says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak, God sending forth his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came, in the, he came in flesh, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin died and condemned sin in his flesh. So we see him as the appointed son. We see his appointed name. He came from the bosom of the father to the bosom of a woman. He became the son of man so that we could become the sons of God. He was born contrary to the laws of nature. He lived in poverty, was reared in obscurity. In infancy, he startled a king. In boyhood, he puzzled the doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He never wrote a song. And yet he supplied the theme for more songs than all songwriters combined. He he never was a military general. Yet he boasts of the largest volunteer army the world has ever known. He never practiced medicine. Yet he healed more broken hearts then all the physicians together have healed broken bodies. Great men have lived and died, but he lives on forever. Go stand in the gateway of the city of the dead and call the name of great men. Socrates! And a voice answers. Here. Buddha! Present, Muhammad, here. But go call the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And an angel answers, he is not here, he is risen. Herod could not kill him, death could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him. All have failed, but he never. He is the ever perfect one. He is the root and the offspring of David. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is Yeshua, and we know him as Jesus. And never be ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given among men whereby men must be saved than by the name of Jesus Christ. He is an appointed son. He has an appointed name. But there's an announced purpose as well. Look at these verses. So we see this broken up into two parts. And I want you to see the word shall. Matter of fact, I don't even know a passage of scripture in the entire Bible that has more shells or shelts than in these verses. Listen to this. And what does that indicate? 
that indicates this is going to happen. As sure as he is the king, as sure as he is ruler. And you know, right about now in our lives and in our culture and what's happening in our country, sometimes you kind of wonder about the sovereignty of God. But let me tell you what did happen and then what's going to happen because we have two parts here. The first part deals with his first coming. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. That's going to be the first coming. And bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua, Jesus. Jehovah saves. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. That's his first coming. Now look at this. And the Lord God shall give, second coming, Unto him the throne of his father David. This passage of scripture is really the beginning of a fulfilled prophecy, promise, that God gave to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, when it says that, David, you will have seed that will reign forever. That seed now is going to be born in Bethlehem, where David was born as well. And he shall reign, look at verse 33, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. His first coming, he came to redeem. His second coming is to rule. His first coming was as a savior. His second coming will be as a sovereign. Now, Brother Scheller, what did it mean then when Jesus entered in that last week on earth and he entered what we call the week before the resurrection, his triumphal entry? Then what was triumphal about it if this is partially referred to the second coming? I'll tell you what it is. Since the creation of Adam and Eve, no human being before or since Christ has ever conquered sin. No one has ever lived a perfect life until Christ. And when he rides on that donkey, on that Sunday morning that we call the triumphal entry. Well, what was so triumphant about it if he's going to die in, in, in six days or five days or whatever? I'll tell you what was triumphant. He is the first human being that has ever gone through life without thinking, saying, or doing anything that was contrary to this book. He lived the absolute perfect life, and now it's triumphant that man has finally had a representative that could die for all mankind. You see, you want to do whatever you want to do and die for your sins? Can't do it because of your sin. And you can you know what? I'm willing to die for all of mankind. You can't do it because you've sinned. You got to pay for your sin. But Christ entered triumphantly because he lived the perfect life. This is an announced purpose. It's got two parts in it. And then we see Mary's response, the miracle of our king. Look at verse number 34. Mary is not doubting that it will happen, but Mary has a question on how. Then said Mary unto the angel, I just got one thing. I really believe you, Gabriel, but I do have a question. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Enter in now the importance of the virgin birth. For the only way that we could have God being our sacrifice is he has got to go around the Adamic nature that every one of us were born with. Nobody had to teach you how to do what's wrong. Every one of us have a propensity to attract towards sin. Every one of us naturally lie. Every one of us naturally lose our temper in the wrong way. Every one of us naturally lust. Every one of us have a propensity to do what is wrong, but not Christ. 
And the virgin birth is an absolute necessity. Hold your place in Luke 1. We will be back. Quickly turn over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. If you've never heard these verses before, this, uh, I think, is the whole key to salvation. In Romans 5, verse 12, it says this. Help me out, by the way. I think you know who these people are. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Everyone together, who is that one man? Adam, very good. Wherefore, by as Adam, one man. But the one is a very important thing here. One man, sin entered into the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. We all have that Adamic nature. We've all sinned by birth and by choice. By our nature, excuse me, and by our choice. But look at verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Brother Scheller, I'm not sure I understand. No, 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 no. Listen, this is going to get good. For if through the offense of one, that would be Adam... Many, that would be us, be dead. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by that grace, which is by one man. Everyone together, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Brother Scheller, this sounds really interesting, but I just have to tell you, I'm still not sure what we're reading. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Yeah, that isn't fair, Brother Shadow. One guy sins and all of us have to, have to be judged because that doesn't seem fair that one guy represents us in a garden. Hey, give me a shot to take that fruit or not take that fruit, okay? Why does one guy have to represent us? Oh, stop. Look at the rest of the verse. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Well, if God can judge all of us through one representative, Adam, and we all have that Adamic nature, then look at this. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. If God can have one person represent all of us in that garden, and he falls and all of us get his Adamic nature, then in his justice to justify us and declare us righteous, he can allow one person to be our substitute. He can allow one representative to represent mankind. And can I tell you, on the cross of Calvary, the absolute, perfect Son of God cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at that moment, every sin you and I ever committed was put on the perfect Son of God as our substitute. And if we all died in Adam, we can all live in Jesus Christ. And what is Christmas? Christmas is the celebration of the birth of the Savior who was born of a virgin. It had to be one who had no relationships, intimacy with a, with a man that she would conceive in her womb the Son of God. He was a man. He was just as much a man and, and mankind as we are. He was a human and yet he was God. And there was no sin to be found in him. That is the miracle of our king, our king. A miraculous conception. And then finally, a manifested obedience. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 1. And wow, this is really touching. <laughs> we believe that Mary was probably a teenage girl when this occurred. Whether she was 16, 17, 18, whatever it was. She was a young lady. Can you imagine in her little dwelling place, in this little humble place called Nazareth, to receive a message like this? But notice her response. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. This is how it's going to be done, Mary. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Hey, listen, Mary, 
Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth. She hath also conceived a son in her old age. God did that, didn't he? And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, Mary. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary's response is what we close with. And Mary said, Behold, thy doulo, I am your bond slave. We have it translated in our Bible, handmaid. The Greek word we get bond slave from, the feminine gender here, normally it's doulos, the male, but this is a bond slave. Her response to this announcement is, I consent to the will of God. I trust you. And then look at this. She not only consented to the will of God, she consented to the word of God. Look at this. And Mary said, behold, thy handmaid of the Lord, <clears throat> be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Well, you know, we all say these little things, a little invitation here. And she made her little thing. Notice the first three words in verse 39. And Mary, everyone together, and Mary what? Arose. The word arose is the word to begin a journey. And our sister in Christ, Mary, begins a journey of faith that she surrenders her will to God she consents, God, your will be done. I think this is her Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know what she's doing? I surrender my will. Come on. Did this girl understand all the dots? Hey, by the way, this young lady who's highly preferred, that's got all this grace upon her, does she go through affliction? Oh, big time. Oh, big time. The pain that this woman goes through, the affliction, well, she's not that highly favored, is she? The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Mary was highly favored. Not that she was absent from struggle. Not that she was absent from sickness. Not that she was absent from heartache. Not that she was absent from pain. She was highly favored on how she was used by God. And I want to tell you this, Lancaster Baptist Church, it is God's grace not to spare us from all kinds of heartache, but to actually use us in the heartache for his glory and for his honor. This woman goes through a lot of pain in her life. I think the road on the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem because of the taxing, I don't think she's going like, wow, this is what highly preferred means. And yet, she was given a grace upon her. Why? Because she consented to his will. And then I close with this. And she consented to his word. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I was obviously going through and putting together pastor's message. Pastor had one passage of scripture at the very end under consented to his word. It's been one of my favorite verses during covid it's found in Jeremiah. Would you turn there? Jeremiah 29, on the very last spot, I think there's one more verse after this that he wrote, but under consented to his word, pastor's got this in his notes, and I went like, oh, I love this. Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah is writing a letter under the inspiration. It's really from God, but he's the human instrument, the pen that writes it out. And it's a, a letter written to those that are in captivity. And by the way, Lancaster Baptist, this is the coolest thing of everything I studied yesterday. I looked up the word captivity in Jeremiah 29. You know what the word is for captivity? The Hebrew word? COVID. Co no. <laughs> 
But I will tell you, there is a great comparison between the captivity that the Jews went through and COVID-19 that we're going through, okay? But then he says this in Jeremiah 29, verse number 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you and would you say the last two words with me? An expected end. God, what are you doing in our country? God, what is going on? Even our pastor who has protected himself so much, he's sick of this. God, what's going on? Can I tell you what's going on? God has thoughts towards us. And the thoughts that he has towards us are good. Leading us to an expected end. God's got a plan, a purpose, and he is still sovereign. He is still on the throne. He is the king that we worship. And this God who gave this promise to Mary in the midst of Roman tyranny, Roman tyranny, you make your comparison, Roman tyranny, that they thought they were going to be delivered from the Roman tyranny of that time. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm not coming the first time to set up my kingdom to free you from Roman tyranny. I'm coming the first time to set you free from the sin tyranny in your heart, to be set free and no longer in bondage. I have an expected end for you. And my expected end for you is that you will spend an eternity with me in heaven. We'll be out of a place of sin, Satan, and sickness forever. There'll be a place I'll take you to. There will be no separation. Oh, no, I've got an expected end for you. And Mary consented to the will of God and to the word of God. Can I encourage you? By consenting to the word and his will, you are swallowed up with a new purpose in your life. And that new purpose is all what Christ has for you and what he's done for you. Jesus is our king and he still reigns. He's still on the throne and he's asking you, will you consent your will Will you surrender your will and will you be swallowed up with my word and will you respond as the handmaid of the Lord? Will you be, God, I'm going to serve you. Hey, by the way, hey gang, we all walked in here servants and we're going to all walk out. And that's why Joshua said, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Not whether you will serve, whom ye will serve. I don't know what your master was coming in, but let your master be going out, our King, Jesus Christ.